So um, let's start. So as consumer, we want to have a safe drinking water. However, the quality of drinking water can be impacted negatively uh, from various problems. Problem can be from the source water or can happen during the treatment of water uh, during the production of the drinking water. So we're, we've been working on several uh, techniques to implement a monitoring uh, system for the safety of the drinking water. So the first um, so the first problem we encountered for the drinking water was the odor, the bad odor in the drinking water. So it's not a health problem, so it's not a toxin, it's not harmful, but it's a great cause of consumer complaint, so it needs to be uh, addressed. So during the uh, treatment train, here, that's a classical water treatment train, uh, the, there's no specific process to remove the, the odor from the water. And the odor is usually coming from those two compounds, geosmin and 2-MIB, that are produced by algae. So algae are usually growing uh, fast during the spring and summer season. So it's a quite a seasonal problem. And the way to address this problem is to add activated carbon here at the water intake. However, this activated carbon is quite expensive and you need to use the right dose not to be able, like a financial burden for the, uh, for the uh, treatment plant. The other way is to use ozone as a year-round odor removal treatment, but it's quite expensive and not uh, available everywhere. So the problem, uh, so the odor problem, as you can see here, um, we identify in a Lake uh, Yamanota near Sasebo, we identify that uh, the other compound responsible for the odor was the 2-MIB and it was related to a specific algae called Pseudoanabaena. So we, m during the weekly monitoring we didn't identify any other uh, algae resp uh, like, uh, increasing at the same time as the 2-MIB. So that pseudoanabaena is a long and thin cyanobacteria and you can see here that the, for Japan the drinking water standard is very low, it's only 10 nanogram per liter. So the analysis of uh, such a low level concentration for the 2MIB requires gas chromatography and mass spectrometry and it needs to be done in the lab. So uh, the analysis is maybe done once a week only. So meaning, if during that one week interval, if you have an odor episode, then you will have a period of non-compliance occurring and customer will complain. And if you use activated carbon at high dose all year round, it will be a financial burden. So the idea we had is, instead of monitoring the odor compound, we would be monitoring the algae responsible for the production, the production of that odor. So with the monitoring of this algae, um, we, we would, um, the, op the plant operator will be able to either add more activated carbon, if necessary, or either switch to a different water source. However, the conventional algae um, consistent algae monitoring is needs skilled labor and also there's a lot of uh, algae with the same similar size so it's really time consuming and it's also done infrequently maybe once a week or less and there's no automated counting technique for this specific algae even if for all the type of algae some other techniques are available uh, like uh, AI or artificial neuronal network, there was none found for this specific um, cyanobacteria. So our objective was um, instead of using the typ uh, typical bright field observation with the microscope, is to use a fluorescence microscope, a microscopy, and 
uh, to develop an automatic counting technique based on this. So the advantage of fluorescence of a bright field observation is that in the river water there's a lot of small debris, there might be sand or other um, living creatures that are not algae. And the, using the fluorescence observation you will, they will not appear on the image. So using an all-in-one fluorescent microscopy microscope uh, that can scan a large area of sample and we use also the software uh, that, I, that is able to set a limit for dimension and fluorescence intensity. We also use a custom-made uh, long-pass filter to target specially chlorophyll contained by the algae. So the first task was to identify unique property of uh, the pseudo anabina, like dimension and fluorescence intensity, and then to validate that uh, a parameter with a different lake water sample collected at different occasions. So here you can see for the cyanobacteria, uh, we target the long and narrow, thin cyanobacteria. So that's the pseudo anabina, and that's another major cyanobacteria called oscillatoria and despite their similar appearance here you can see that they have a different uh, dimension length and width and they have a similar fluorescence intensity but because they have different here dimension uh, like the software is able to uh, separate them and for long and narrow diatom here you can see that they all, have, uh, they all emit strong intensity. So this would be the uh, parameter selected to different diatom from cyanobacteria. And for green algae, it's the same. They emit like strong intensity and they appear uh, whitish because of the strong fluorescence on the, on the image. So this is how the system uh, works. So first, the uh, software and microscope will scan the sample and then the images will be analyzed by the software. So if the dimension are uh, within a set parameter and the intensity will be in the preset parameter as well, then it will be counted as pseudo anabena. And if not, it will be uh, discarded and counted as an another type of algae. So here's the validation work done on the water from the Lake Kasumi Gouda in autumn. So you can notice that the season is uh, different, but um, still, Sodona by now here represented about uh, 4%, and then at the end of autumn, on only 0.3%. So it's, we are really looking at something that is a minority in the, in the water. And here we can see that the manual count uh, and the automated count uh, for pseudo anabina was quite uh, correlated. We found a high correlation. And even though we had some uh, miscounting due to uh, other cyanobacteria or green algae with similar um, dimension or of like a very small pseudo anabina that could not be. Uh, counted and we also have like uh, double counted in sequential image so you can see here that's the same algae but because it appears on two separated images it's counted twice and the last uh, source of error was the, the moving plankton like um, protozoa or cryptomonas that left kind of tra uh, trail of paths like this so because the, the microscope is taking like the same image, uh, the same image on the sample for um, bright field and for fluorescence, we can see here that it, it's moving. See here, it's, it's moving. So that's how we can say it was a, a moving plankton. But despite those uh, small miscounting. Um, we found for sure that the pseudo was responsible for the bad order in the water, even at very low concentration. 
and it could be uh, counted based on their dimension and the fluorescence intensity. And despite the small error found, uh, quite a good correlation was found. And this is not to be used as accurate count, but it's used as a surrogate indicator for odor. So it could be useful for the early detection of the odor in the water treatment process and could have like a, a quite a good implication for the drinking water treatment plant. Because early detection of the bad odor would allow the operator either to switch to a different water source or to um, use a, um, a more activated carbon to remove the water and avoid the consumer complaint. So our future research will be um, looking at other odor uh, causing algae, such as Anabina and Oscillatoria, and also at uh, implementing an online uh, counting system using a flow cell and a time lapse capture of the sample. So that was not. Um, that was more for a quality point of view for the drinking water. And now for the safety of the drinking water, we also look at the online monitoring of the bacteria. So for typical sound filter uh, drinking uh, treatment plants, uh, usually turbidity or particle are used as surrogate indicator for the quality of water. Or from time to time, the plant could uh, use uh, colony forming bacteria. However, most of the bacteria are not culturable, so it's not a really good indicator. And another method will be to use uh, fluorescence microscopy and stain to, count, to have an uh, accurate count of the bacteria. However, it takes time and needs to be done in, uh, by a laboratory, so it's not done really often. So why is it really important to have uh, good monitoring for the bacteria? It is because um, in the water, there's protozoa cysts that are uh, bigger than bacteria, but uh, turbidity and particle were not found to be very good surrogate indicator for those cysts. And those cysts are pathogen and they cause disease in animals and humans. So that's why it's very important to ensure they are removed by the sun filter. And studies have found that bacteria were actually a better surrogate indicator for the removal of the protozoa cyst. So that's why um, a lot of studies have been working on the monitoring of bacteria. So one of the approach could be flow cytometry. So dyes are added to stain the bacteria and then by a, um, a counter, uh, the number of dead and alive bacteria is given. However, it's not designed for plant operation if, because it uses a lot of stain and it's not designed for continuous use. So, to enhance the safety of the water, uh, we propose to monitor the bacteria, um, the bacteria removal, so before and after the sun filter, to have a tool to diagnose the system. So the counter we are using for our study is a typical uh, particle counter. However, it also has captors that capt uh, fluorescence emitted by riboflavin and a NADH that are two compounds found in all bacteria. So if the particle is of the bacteria size and it has some fluorescence here, it is counted as a bacteria. If not, it is counted as a particle. So the advantage of this counter is that no dilution or no stain addition is required. However, the problem is that for uh, lake water or um, river water, they contain a lot of humic lab substance that are non-particle, but they emit strong emission in the range used by the sensor of the counter. And the fluorescence emitted by the bacteria is quite weak. So we need to remove those humic lab substance. So we design a, 
a process, a dialysis process, to remove here, you can see, to remove this dissolved organic. So the sun filter effluent, the water, will go through the dialysis membrane where the uh, dissolved organic will um, tra uh, traverse, will be separated and will go in the dialysate and they will be captured here by anion exchange resin. And the um, sample will just go through the real-time biological counter. So here you can see the effect of the dialysis treatment. So that's the fluorescence uh, for non-treated water and the fluorescence for treated water. So here you can see the two uh, band, wavelength band used by the counter and you can see that the fluorescence is quite decreased. It's decreased enough for the sensor to work properly. And here as well you can see all the dissolved organic fluorescence are removed by the treatment, ne nearly all. So the bacteria and particle monitoring for the sun filter over time. Here you can see after backwashing we have um, a, a, a big increase of the bacteria and the particle count, but that's to be expected after backwashing and then it decreased slowly and here you have like a, a steady state. So that steady state is important because it can use as a, um, as a basic baseline, as a baseline and whatever is uh, above that baseline could, be, could trigger an alarm for the plant operator. Could, could be mean, it could mean that there's a malfunction or a problem for one or several sun filters. And the important thing also is that you can see the particle number is one order higher than the bacteria counter. So that's why particle counter might not be a very good indicator for the bacteria because there's a lot more particle than bacteria. So that's why bacteria are a better surrogate for the removal of the protozoa as well. So here you can see after backwashing um, in detail. So the particle, there's one peak and for the bacteria there's two, two peaks, two increase. And for all the backwashing, following all the backwashing event, there's those two peaks. So yeah, that's a good indicator that the bacteria counter is more sensitive to variation than the, only the particle counter. So to compare uh, the online counter with other um, techniques, so here you can see the plate count result. So here there's a quite a, a lower value and a lot of variation, so plate count are not a really uh, good monitoring um, technique. And here for, we, we try different uh, stain with fluorescence microscopy and you can see the total bacteria and the non-damaged bacteria. So we found a similar order here, a similar number. And however, we have found only one good correlation with the total bacteria uh, for the total bacteria used with cyber grain stain. Um, however, because of the fluorescence microscopy, we are looking at the bacterial DNA and the counter is looking at molecule inside the bacteria, they are not looking at exactly the same thing. And different stain also have different uh, staining property. Like we know, for example, that cytonine uh, has uh, less uh, staining uh, for different kind of bacteria. So that's why even if those stain are giving the same total bacteria result, there's a, a variation that could be explained by the binding of the stain to the DNA. And also for the sun filter, the bacteria, there's a pre-correlation step, so the bacteria can be weakened and those uh, two compounds, riboflavin and NADH, might, the fluorescent of those two compounds might depend on the state of the bacteria. So after chlorination, probably most of the bacteria are not really thriving. 
and we have also checked uh, for information the community analysis and we found that most of the um, bacteria um, like uh, proteobacteria uh, was dominant and it was typical for the sand filter so this counter could be used for mo uh, probably most of the sand filter so by going online with the online counter we could have a tool to diagnose the system so if you have like a counter before and after let's say each sound filter if there's a problem in one sound filter you would be able to pinpoint that sound filter or if you have only two then you you might see oh, okay there's a problem overall so that's really giving a tool for the water treatment plant to diagnose the system and, and be sure that uh, those compounds, those pathogens are removed. So the pretreatment was uh, removed the background intensity substance uh, successfully for all the 19 days of the study. And we uh, achieved a real-time counting of the bacteria without using stain or dilution. And uh, we found a good correlation for the um, bacterial count with the, obtained with the counter and obtained with the cyber green. And it's, it could be a tool used to check the variation in the, in the bacterial concentration in the water. And as I said, it could be a uh, good tool to diagnose the system and check any filter malfunction or contamination in the sand filter. So by using those online tools, it could uh, mean a significant improvement for the drinking water quality. And the last problem we've worked on is uh, the removing uh, uh, of the bromate from the water. So here, it's a, a problem encounter for the potable reuse. So if you see here, that's the uh, a diagram showing the usage of the water. So from lake or river, it will go to the drinking water treatment plant. It will be used by the community, go to the waste water treatment plant, and might be going to the advanced water treatment for either indirect reuse, so like going back to the river, or for direct reuse, where it's going back straight to the drinking water treatment plant. So there's two systems for uh, advanced wastewater treatment. The reverse osmosis system, which is based on reverse osmosis and then disinfection, with here the arrow concentrate discharge. However, for inland location, the arrow concentrate cannot be easily discarded. So they use a non-arrow membrane system with here ozonation and activated carbon and then ultrafiltration and disinfection. The problem is that ozone created several disinfection byproducts. So the bromate ion is a potential carcinogen and is formed by ozonation. And here the maximum level is 10 microgram per liter for drinking water. So there's regulation here in Japan for this compound. So you can see here that after ozonation, there's quite um, the concentration increase a lot. And after it's reduced by activated carbon, either there's, we need to be sure that it's within that level. So f to enhance the safety of the recycled water, we use an online bromate ion analyzer to check the level of bromate in the water. So here is the uh, bromate sensor and it has detection limit for a very low uh, concentration that are concentration found after uh, activating carbon treatment. And it provides analysis every 19 minutes. So here, under acidic condition, 
the bromate ion will react with a TFP and the sensor will be looking at the variation of fluorescence because under acidic condition that TFP will uh, go and uh, there will be creation of dimer that don't have any fluorescence and here for the and it, the concentration of bromate will be given by uh, those two analyses and the difference of the kinetic reaction here. So we are looking at fluorescence here, but you can see in the treated wastewater there's high fluor background fluorescence intensity. So meaning that our sensor cannot operate properly. So we need to remove this background fluorescence uh, substance. So this time we use a nanofiltration membrane that will allow us to separate the interference substance from the bromate ion. So the wastewater will go through that membrane and then to the bromate ion sensor. So here is a diagram of the system. So the water from a feed tank will go through a water bath to, uh, to control the temperature and then go through the nanofiltration membrane where uh, the, the humic lag substance will be separated and then the bromate uh, solution will go in a collection tank and then from there to the